I hate standing behind podiums. <laughs> so um, my name is Paul Groth, and I wanted to really follow up from uh, Jan to tell you a little bit more that what he was talking about is technically feasible and already being done in production, and what that really means for, uh, for publishers. And so I want to talk about this concept of machine reading. Uh, off, I just wondered, how many of you guys uh, use Gmail? Just out of a, OK, thanks. That's a good piece of information to know. Um, so machine reading is the automa automatic, unsupervised understanding of text. So how many people have heard of natural language processing, just for me as well? So you guys know NLP. So I'll compare what NLP is and uh, machine reading, and we'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to give you some examples of where machine reading is being put into practice already. Um, and it's pri primarily from things you already use, namely search engines. So when I came here, if you use Gmail, uh, now in front of your flights, right, you get this nice little display that tells you when you're supposed to be there on top of your email. And so this is driven by reading your email, obviously, but also having a background knowledge base or database that knows about flights, right? Um, and if you go to Google now and type um, Society for Scholarly Publishing, uh, what you'll see is not only the normal organic search results, but these boxes. Have you guys seen these boxes in your search results? And the interesting thing about those boxes is they're not only taken from Wikipedia, but also from query logs and from something that Jan mentioned called the Google Knowledge Graph, right? So this is information about entities in the real world um, and also properties about those entities, the graphs we saw before. And these are mined directly, primarily, from reading the web, essentially. So they ingest the entire web, and they do a large-scale processing of, of web pages, and also various forms of background knowledge bases. Um, and this is used to power uh, a lot of the new mobile question answering systems. So uh, you have Google Now, where you can talk to your phone and ask it, uh, the time of day. And the interesting thing here is these kinds of knowledge graphs are really important for these sorts of question answering systems because they, um, um, you need to understand the concepts that people are talking about because we're very, um, we don't give you as much information in queries when you're doing uh, natural language speech. So uh, um, Microsoft has one called Cortana. You've probably used Siri if you have an iPhone. And all of these systems have these large-scale knowledge bases that are read from the web sitting behind them. Okay. Um, and if you've heard of Watson, uh, Watson does the same thing as well. right? So it does large-scale reading of the web and reading of various background material combined with databases to produce a knowledge base that can be then used for question answering. And so I was actually uh, at a conference last week, which was very much different than this conference. It was full of geeks. It was a worldwide web conference. And I was on a panel with guys from uh, Microsoft talking about knowledge graphs and guys from Google talking about knowledge graphs. And the interesting thing is the two members of that panel uh, were both from the Watson team, right? The guys working at Google and the girl working at, at Microsoft. So Watson works the same way. So reading the web, combining this with background knowledge. Now, this is quite good for, say, you know, find me my flight time, or uh, give me information about the Society of Scholarly Publishing, or find me something about Kim Kardashian, or uh, actors related to Kim, Kim Kardashian, because that's the kind of material that's made available on the web. And you say, well, does that apply to uh, scholarly content? And the answer is uh, yes. Um, uh, a good start to this is uh, the Google Medical Graph, which they uh, launched this sh just in January, where they're taking content sources primarily from the Mayo Clinic and producing um, this kind of knowledge graph where if you're on your phone, right, so you're using Google Now and you ask something like, give me something about tonsillitis, it will come back with factual information about tonsillitis, so what kind of prescri prescriptions you might get, self-treatment, uh, even give you these kind of uh, nifty diagrams. And what's interesting about this is this is primarily done automatically, right? They do some curation on the back end where they inject people, but it's primarily done automatically. 
And um, it keeps going, right? So these uh, search engine pr providers are coming into this space quite rapidly. This is an uh, example of Bing, and this feature was just released uh, this, this month. So if you've heard of Microsoft Academic Search, uh, what happened with Microsoft Academic Search is they closed it down. It was a research project. They've now integrated Microsoft Academic Search into the main search engine, Bing, of Microsoft. Okay, and so um, now if you go to Bing, you type in dub 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 2015, on the side you'll get the same kind of uh, uh, structured information that you got before. Where it was, it was Florence, I ate a lot of pasta last week. Um, the subject, when the submissions are due, which is quite useful for authors of that conference, when you get your notification date, and also, hey, you didn't get published at dub dub dub, where else can you submit your article to? Another example from this integration of Microsoft Academic Search and this knowledge graph into uh, Bing is uh, the search for uh, concepts, scientific concepts. And I like this one because if you search for normal distributions, you get all the kind of normal background information. But on the bottom, you get different kinds of distributions. So you get Poisson or binomial or log normal distribution. And so this is really understanding what it means to be a distribution. Right? It's not just searching for normal distribution. It understands that this concept of, of uh, normal distribution is related to these other kinds of statistical distributions. Um, and I highly encourage you, uh, they were demoing this last week, uh, to go check out their demo uh, for uh, the Microsoft Academic Search. And you can't really read it, but they were doing some very cool uh, question answering systems. So this one says, find me papers by Leslie Lamport uh, while he was at Microsoft, right? So Le Leslie Lamport was a famous uh, professor in computer science, but he wasn't always at Microsoft, only for a limited time. And it'll figure out which papers are there. Or you can ask questions like, find me all the papers uh, about mu mu multiple sclerosis that uh, um, cite papers from artificial intelligence. So deep analytics. Um, and the way they're able to do this is uh, by being on this search inf infrastructure, they're essentially able to create one of these graphs. So this is their statistics. So they've cataloged about 100 million papers they've identified. But importantly, they've identified 20 million authors, 700,000 institutions, 50,000 fields of study, and venues. And this is all integrated into their normal Bing knowledge graph with uh, the concept of Kanye West or the concept of the Society of Scholarly Publishing, all in this graph. So we, this is all a first really glance of what these knowledge graphs can do, but we want to do things that look more like uh, what Jan was showing with Lazarus. So you want kind of this deep, um, deep data sets, right? So things that are really about the content so drugs or chemicals or uh, properties of those chemicals. And so this is a kind of database that we have, uh, we produce in Elsevier called Reaxis. And this is primarily done by hand. We do some uh, automation to create the, the database, but a lot of it is done through curation. And you can imagine what we'd like to do is not do that automatically. Be able to create, ooh, uh, be able to create these databases automatically, but also interlink these really high quality databases with all this other material that's out there on the web. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the techniques. Um, and I didn't know how uh, kind of deep to go on the, the computer science side. So it's fairly high level, but I'm happy to go uh, deeper if, if anybody wants to. Um, so natural language processing, right? So this reminds you some of natural language processing. So we have a bunch of documents. And really, an NLP is about, OK, we take a look at one document, right? One paper. And we do the kind of analysis that we want. So we may do, may do named entity recognition. So go find, give me some sort of ontology or some sort of vocabulary, and go find all those entities in the text, right? So Rolling Stone magazine or uh, Ryan Connor. So this is kind of classic named entity recognition for NLP. And so the big difference, the, the core thing to realize is here we focus on each 
individual paper as a unit, right? So we give the paper to the system, it looks at the paper, spits out some knowledge. So the big difference with machine reading is we look at everything. We look at everything in the entire uh, corpus that we have, and we use the kind of statistical regularities and all that knowledge to produce our results. So we forget about the boundaries of our particular document, and we just look at everything all at once. And this lets us produce the kind of uh, big scale knowledge graphs that really know about the world, know about the entities in the world. And so you get the kind of uh, graphs that you were talking about where you can connect across different domains, right? So we can go from information about K. Anders Ericsson to the fact that he was the inspiration for the 10,000 hour rule. And we can go from that to that he was a colleague of Herbert Simon, and Herbert Simon won the Nobel Prize. And this kind of ability to produce this kind of, uh, you called it a map or a knowledge graph, is really powerful for doing um, hypothesis generation or doing search across different kinds of domains. And I want to show you one kind of uh, leading example of this that I, I really like a lot um, of using machine reading. Uh, this is an example from paleont paleontology. This is the paleo biology database. So this is a, a database of fossils and where they were found and um, uh, different taxonomic names for these fossils and what kind of animal they were talking about. And this is a database that has been built up over many years by hand, primarily by scientists reading the literature. Some of it comes from direct from data, but they really read the literature and have built this by hand. It's a lot, a lot of work. And so, um, I think last year, uh, yeah, this is a 2014 paper, uh, a group at Stanford and a group at uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison developed a machine reading system, so similar to what we were talking about, to actually produce an, this paleobiology database. And so what they did was they tried to reproduce the database and check that it was right. And they were, it's quite accurate. Um, I'm going to show you uh, one of these super uh, uh, ungodly architecture. I, I really like this diagram, right? So, but it's a, it, don't worry, this is kind of the architecture of their system. But I want to, you don't have to understand the whole thing. But there's two interesting things to understand about it. Uh, one is that they use not only the text itself, but they also use the tables in the data, but they also use the actual layout information that they get from image recognition on the page in order to understand some of these concepts. So that's a really uh, important point. So they use every piece of information they possibly can get to help them create this database. And the other thing to, to mention is that um, uh, what they do is they encode everything into one ginormous table. So again, they, they use everything all at once. And that's something I, I think is a really different way of thinking about it. So really destroying the boundaries of, of, of the document. So that's a really interesting idea. So re being able to build these kind of curated databases automatically uh, from text and other uh, in image sources. So this is a project called Deep Dive. Um, and uh, you, if you go to Stanford or deepdive.stanford.com, uh, they have all this background material uh, you can get really, if you're a computer science person, you can go really mad, great papers and stuff. But I wanted to point out one thing is they've already done analytics on a ton of open access papers, right? So they've done analytics and made it all available for download for uh, PubMed Central, but also I think almost all of PLOS, uh, plus tons and tons of, I think, all of archive. So they've done these analytics and built some of these databases, these fact databases from them automatically. It's a really cool resource. So what you see here is this ability to automatically machine read from lots of text um, is really changing the game, right? You see it changing the game in the way we do uh, web search. And I think it's really going to change the way we do our applications for science. And I think this has some, um, 
you know, ramifications for publishers in particular, or as I think Elsevier, we call it, we, we're now called an information solutions provider or something like this. Um, uh, and so what are those things that you need to think about if you are a publisher? So I think, uh, think paper is not paper, right? So get rid of this arbitrary boundary between the articles that you have, just throw it all into a blender and then think about the applications that you can create. Uh, the other one is, I think, is augment your con uh, content. And I think Jan was pointing this out before. So, you know, we have this, I think Elsevier has something like 23 million papers that it publishes, right? But that's not really a lot. It's a lot, but it's not a lot, right? By using other data sources out there, whether it's data from the web, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's uh, open access articles from other publishers, whether it's image data, think about augmenting your existing content to enrich what you already have, right? And providing that content base, even if you're not gonna be producing one of these knowledge graphs, is really vital for uh, machine reading. I think this is a really hard one to get our, our minds around, is this notion of automating and then curating. Because as publishers, uh, we uh, curate and then maybe we automate. And what I mean by curate is we send everything through this peer review process, right? Um, which is fine, it's great. And that's a lot of work, right? And so it's really important to think about all this work being done, are we getting the best use out of that work? And I think a lot of times the answer is no, right? We could be using that peer review work, that editorial work, to help our automated systems to drive applications. So really, if you, in general, if you think about it, automate and then curate. I'll reiterate Jan's point about multiple formats and not because I care about uh, authors, I am, uh, or readers, I am a scientist, I read papers. Multiple formats is nice for me, but I think it's more nice for the machine. And the important point here is that uh, you can get a lot of information Right? So I actually don't believe we'll do a lot of hand markup to build these databases. I think we'll let machines read to do it, but we need to give as much possible information to the machine in order for it to do its work. And part of that is providing multiple formats, not only in XML, but also that layout information that you get in the PDF is quite useful for these kind of machine reading systems. So any kind of data, any kind of data you can provide. And that leads into my uh, next point, Save everything, okay? Uh, if, if you're a, you're a publisher, uh, you have lots of data that you may not think is useful. It is useful, I guarantee you that. Uh, it's useful for these kinds of systems. So um, we have data science scientists at Elsevier. Data scientists love data, right? Um, and actually your usage data, if you have any usage data, that is super precious. Right? Because usage data tells us what's important. Okay, about 99% of all search queries are for particular entities in the world. So new uh, things about like airports or this Hilton or uh, chemical compounds. And about 25% of uh, search queries have new entities that nobody's ever thought of in them. And this is stats I'm getting from Google from last week. Right? So the point is, is any of this usage data extremely important and really can help drive these kind of uh, algorithms. So if you're into alt metrics, it's not just for impact, it's for driving new kinds of applications. And so you might say, well, why are we building these kinds of things? We're, we can do better search, uh, we can build these kind of curated databases. I think there's more to applications of scientific content than just downloading PDFs. Right, so this is my, uh, I think this is my favorite Elsevier uh, application. Uh, not in, it's not really that amazing, but what's cool about it is this is AutoCAD, right? So this is an engineering uh, environment where you're designing uh, products. And in the corner, you can go to a database called Novel. You click on it, you can do your search terms right in the actual um, uh, application itself get the variables you need or the, the properties you need for your design, 
and go back into it yourself. And this is the kind of future application I see. Lots of small content snippets right in the application, right in the experimental uh, environment, right at the clinical care environment that you see. And this is uh, the kind of thing you need to think about instead of just being, oh, our application is downloading a PDF. So two more slides. Um, so machine reading is the automated and unsupervised understanding of text. Give it a bunch of text, we'll understand it. What are the implications for this as what you should think about as, as a publisher? One, think papers, not paper. Uh, think about what other kinds of content you can bring in. Automate and then curate. Um, embrace multiple formats and then just get, collect as much stuff as you can, right? If you've got data, keep it. Don't throw it away. And there's all these other applications and when you stop thinking about the boundaries of the paper, you can start thinking of really drivers for scientific applications. And I think this is really uh, necessary uh, because of this fact. Um, I've seen this slide a lot in, in, in publisher land and the slide is usually seen as a positive thing, right? So we have a growth in the number of authors or the number of researchers and we have a, a growth in the number of uh, papers produced in the number of journals and they parallel each other kind of perfectly, right? So we have 4% growth in the number of researchers in the world, so we have 4% growth in the number of papers. I think this is a travesty, right? If we're having all these more researchers, we should have from 1980 to 1995 to 2000, we should have exponential curves. We should be able to produce so many papers that we don't know what to do with it and that we really do need machines to read them all. Right? We have a crisis, I think, of productivity in science and we don't, we're not applying technologies, we're using old technologies, so we're not getting those exponential increases in productivity that we, uh, we really need. Um, and there's some interesting uh, things about why that's the case. I think it's primarily uh, this notion of a burden of knowledge and there's this guy named Benjamin F. Jones who has a really nice economic model uh, about this and I suggest you look at that. So we really need more and better academic productivity through the help of technology, through the help of using big literature and big usage of the literature. 